Hear me okay? Ooh, lots of echo. Uh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Julian, that's me on the internet. You can find me in various places. Uh, I'll try and share the slides afterwards. And I hope to leave plenty of time for questions in the end, although feel free to interrupt me uh, as we go. Um, so I work for a company called Magnetic. Um, just a 30-second uh, background. We're in marketing tech. We use PyPy. That's why I'm here. Usually they send me to fun international places. It's actually the first conference I've ever spoken at in the US, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but I, yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, and you know, like everyone else, we're hiring. So if you want to talk to me about work after this, feel free. Uh, there's a bunch of my coworkers here too. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about PyPy. But just for some context, uh, we'll kind of start at the beginning. Um, maybe it would be worthwhile uh, just to ask, like, how many people, if I say, can you tell me what the definition of like a compiler and an interpreter is, how many people would be able to answer? OK. Small number, maybe a little less than half. So for those of you, um, this might be a little bit slow, but we'll start from scratch. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just for some background. So uh, programs, right? So what's a program? Um, so I, I kind of like the simplest sense. Uh, a program is basically. Um, something written in some language that takes a bunch of inputs and produces a bunch of outputs. Um, so whatever it is, roughly, um, it's that. Um, so yeah, like Google Chrome, I mean, maybe your input is like you typing stuff into the address bar, and your output is like the rendering of python.org. I apologize, that's quite small, but hopefully nothing else will end up being that small. Um, so it's a program. Uh, I think in the case of Chrome, it's like, a bunch of C and C++ stuff tied together with a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, it's a thing written in some language. Uh, you give it some input. It produces some output. Um, <clears throat> getting kind of down to like, as far as we can go, like CPUs execute uh, machine code, right? Which is basically uh, a bunch of binary. Um, you pass through uh, machine code through the CPU, and it does what you tell it to. Um, side note, just for um, just for fun. Uh, Potentially, machine code, uh, the CPU is taking that machine code and turning it into a bunch of other stuff and not actually executing the exact x86 assembly, let's say, that you're giving it. So at the end of the day, whatever your program is written in, it has to get down to like whatever instruction set your CPU is going to execute. Uh, and so for our story before, where you know, we have a program, at some point, whatever language your program is written in, you have to turn it into something that is just exactly that, like a bunch of machine code that your CPU can execute. Um, so you still have your in input, you still have your output, um, but you have to have some sort of like machine code that you're going to run, um, no matter what you started with, um, Python or whatever other language. Um, you have to ultimately execute what your CPU knows how to execute, which is, for most of us, like x86 assembly or whatever. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so just a side note, because um, we got here. So interpreters and compilers, uh, a nice sort of blurry world. Uh, between the two of them. Um, but it's relevant for Python, and it's relevant for us. So Python's an interpreter. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how it works, both in the case of CPython and PyPy. Um, but there's kind of a nuanced difference here between an interpreter and a compiler. Um, when we say compiler, uh, we'll talk about like a thing that takes a piece of source code and turns it into machine code. Um, there are compilers that compile to other targets, but that's what I'll mean. Um, and by an interpreter, we'll mean uh, a piece of software, a program, that takes some source code and turns it into something intermediate that then executes on um, some other higher level machine. Um, we'll talk about some more in a minute. Um, but Python is, uh, in that sense, an interpreter. Uh, it's a piece of software that takes Python source code and executes it um, without first turning it into machine code. So you don't, get, you don't take Python and turn it into like a single binary. It's not Rust or C or any of those languages. Um, so specifically, let's start talking a little bit about CPython. Um, so CPython is, for, for those of you who don't know, CPython is what you're going to get if you just type Python and don't otherwise know you have something else. So if you downloaded something um, from the internet or from your package manager or from wherever else you're getting you know, your software, CPython is what you got. Um, and the reason why it's called CPython we'll talk about in a minute, but it's basically written in C. There's your answer. Um, and uh, it's a program. Right, so back to our original definition of what a program is, it takes some input and it produces some output. 
Um, in the case of C Python and the case of like interpreters in general, the input that it's taking is the source code that you wrote. So you typed some like Python into a file, or like someone gave you some. Um, that's your input to C Python, uh, and the actual process that C Python uh, goes through to actually execute it. Um, there's a step in the middle there, which again comes back to our same conversation from before. So C Python takes the source code that you gave it, turns it into some bytecode, which we'll see in a minute, uh, and then it takes that bytecode and executes it on a VM. Uh, and a VM uh, is basically, you can think of it as a virtual CPU. So our actual CPU, um, we make believe, let's say, it takes x86 assembly or whatever assembly language your CPU takes. A VM is a fake CPU implemented in software. Um, so it's a piece, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a giant loop, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and that giant loop takes an instruction set, and that instruction set is basically going to be used to execute our Python code. Uh, and if you look at CPython, uh, if you've ever pulled apart the CPython source, there's a file in the CPython source tree called like cfl.c, and in there is basically a giant, I think in Python 3 it changed a little bit, but like in Py2 it was basically like a giant case statement. Uh, and like each of the cases in the case statement is like one of the bytecodes that the VM accepts. Um, and so, well, uh, for every, Gabe, you have a password? We're about to find out. I'm glad you do. If you didn't have a password, I would yell at you. There you go. <laughs> uh, so uh, in CPython, um, the bytecode instructions that we're about to see uh, get passed through uh, this loop, which basically just switch cases over each of the bytecodes that flows through the interpreter uh, and executes them one by one. And if you look in cval.c, you'll see implementations for each of the bytecode instructions that we'll see. So I'll show you some examples in a minute as soon as we get back plugged in here. Thank you, sir. Any questions so far? Good. <clears throat> uh, so here's this kind of dumb little function. Uh, so uh, I would assume a lot of you have probably seen both halves of this. Um, but again, just for background, we'll go through both. So on the left here is some Python source code. Uh, kind of a strange function, but it's just for a bit of demonstration. So it takes two numbers. Uh, if x is bigger than y, then it adds them. Otherwise, it subtracts them. Why? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so there's this thing called the disk module, um, which you might have played with before. Basically, uh, it's a module that can take a bunch of different kinds of objects and show you um, human readable and not so human readable inter uh, uh, lists of the bytecode that that code object will actually execute, in this case, the functions code object. Um, so if we pass in the function, um, we can kind of read this from the top. Gabe, can I ask you to, I'll put this on your desk just so that you hit the, like, move the mouse when your computer's about to go off. Oh, I lost the screen. Okay. Um, so if we just read this from the top, it's, it's actually not that hard to read. It's somewhat typical of, uh, of kind of like high-level VMs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, load fast is basically a bytecode instruction that loads a variable. So we're going to kind of compile this in our head uh, and, and see how that compares to the bytecode on the right. So if you think about how this function is going to execute, the first thing that it does really is it needs to know uh, what's the value of x and what's the value of y. And those were variables that were um, kind of like passed into this function, so it needs to basically look them up. Uh, compare op is basically an instruction that means take the two things that are on the stack, um, which I haven't defined, but basically um, you can think of a stack, if you don't know what it is already, as basically being the place where we're storing the stuff that we're processing. So compare op means take the stuff that's on the stack, compare the two of them. Uh, this one takes a, an argument, so compare op zero means uh, do less than, which is what this code is trying to, trying to do in reverse, actually. Uh, and then pop jump if false means uh, this bytecode told us whether x and y, whether x was less than y. Uh, and if that was false, then we're going to jump to instruction 20, which if you look at the line numbers down here, 20 is going to be the bottom of this loop, which corresponds to there. Um, and so I can, I can kind of read through the rest of these, uh, but I hope it's somewhat clear so far that what's happening here is um, there's basically some Python source code. It's been turned into something somewhat resembling assembly, if you've seen it before. Um, and each of these bytecode instructions kind of like is instructing this VM uh, in C Python to execute a bunch of uh, a bunch of kind of slightly lower level but still fairly high level in, uh, instructions. 
you going to run the slides? Good. Uh, <clears throat> so um, C Python again. Uh, it's written in C. Uh, it's a bytecode compiler and a stack-based VM. It's a bunch of uh, a bunch of words that mean it produces the bytecode on the right and then executes it on top of uh, a stack machine. Uh, and then uh, I'm I'm being slightly not fair, but but roughly C's, uh, C Python's design uh, sort of prioritizes like simplicity of implementation. So like the the C Python implementation is basically trying to be fair, fairly simple and fairly accessible. Uh, actually, from what I hear, I'm not a C programmer. From what I hear, if you read it, it's half decent C code, um, fairly well commented, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but but those bytecode instructions that we had on there, they correspond to many uh, potential actual machine code instructions. So we had that load fast there, which is like, hey, give me the give me the value of some variable. Um, and in my imaginary, uh, quite fantastic world where CPUs take like six bit instructions for some reason, uh, that corresponds to potentially like you know ten instructions, um, which if you can think in your head, you know. Possibly what those are doing is like, oh, load fast uh, means get me the value of some variable. Maybe I need to go look that up in some like array of like where I'm keeping all my uh, values of variables. So you need to like implement that um, using some uh, lower level language, which we said in the case of C Python is C. Um, and in order to actually implement that bytecode instruction, which is tell me the value of this variable, um, there might be potentially more than one assembly instruction or machine code instruction that actually needs to execute in order to perform that operation. Um, and so in the general case, you have like on the left all of the uh, all of the bytecode that your C Python VM needs to execute. And on the right, for every one bytecode, there's potentially like n number of assembly instructions that might actually need to execute in order to run that one piece of bytecode. Now I'm being slightly disingenuous um, when I hit the next slide and I say, okay. So so Python's slow, right? Because like for every uh, for every you know, bytecode instruction that you want to execute, you have to execute, let's say, you know, 30 machine code instructions just to execute one piece of bytecode. Whereas, you know, if you're using some sort of compiled language, um, you would sort of get the minimal set of like assembly that you needed to execute because there wouldn't be this middle layer. And that's kind of the punchline um, uh, in sort of this uh, background information is like ultimately when you have a VM, there is a middle layer in there, and the middle layer is the thing that's executing your bytecode. Um, and so if you get rid of that, you're faster, right? So that's a bit of a lie to begin with, um, and I don't actually mean to tell it in this case. Um, so because of like all sorts of uh, fun complications, uh, and, e and even some non-complications, uh, so sometimes actually a VM tends to be uh, fast because of like branch predictions and like cache missing and like all sorts of other fun low-level things. Um, so. I don't know about those things. You can probably talk to people who are more low-level programmers than I am, uh, and they'll tell you about them. But don't assume immediately that just because you have a middle layer that it's going to be way slower anyways. Um, sometimes like regularity is good for your computer. Um, but even besides all that, um, so no, I'm not, you know, we're not saying Python is slow. First of all, in the pedantic sense, we've just been describing C Python so far, and we're about to talk about PyPy. Um, but second of all, uh, if you think about what we've talked about so far, all of that applies when you're actually executing like computation, right? So bytecodes are like, I need to compute something. Uh, if you're not doing computation, you're fine anyways, right? Like if you need to wait on the network, uh, you need to do something else, um, you're, you're going to be fine, right? The, the, the kind of basic point that we were making where every piece of bytecode might correspond to more than one potential machine code instruction doesn't apply if you're not actually executing bytecode. So certainly don't draw the conclusion uh, so far that like Python is slow, but we can do a little bit better uh, in terms of just like raw CPU me, utilization speed. So, um, so why can't we do better by just doing sort of like the normal thing? The normal thing being, let's say, you know, your C, uh, how does a C compiler work? Again, it takes the source code and produces some machine code. So why can't we just do that for Python? Um, like, why can't we just take the Python source code and produce some machine code in the same way as like other compiled languages might, might do? Um, why do we need like any sort of novel solution? Let's just do the same thing that everyone else is doing. Uh, so it turns out that that's somewhere between very hard and nonsensical. So take a function that looks like this, for example. What assembly do you want to compile this particular function to? Um, so if you hit next, 
So there, have, there is an assembly instruction that does like add a bunch of registers. So like this assembly instruction machine code will basically like take uh, you know a couple of like machine ints I think in, into registers and like add them together, put them somewhere on some other register I assume. Uh, so there is an assembly instruction uh, for like adding two integers, um, but that Python code doesn't add integers, right? It adds like whatever you gave it. So X and Y in that function, like you pass in two integers, it's going to be integer addition. You pass in two strings, it's going to be string addition. You pass in two random like custom user made objects and it's going to be whatever those objects say addition means for them. So that's just a function on its own. If you're a compiler and you see that function, how do you know like literally what, what do you generate for what you're seeing in front of you? Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some like uh, existing kind of like specialized compilers for Python that actually solve that problem in somewhat obvious ways, right? If, if, if you know, in, in, in maybe some specific case, you say like, okay, but, but I'm using this function for integers, and then you know what to generate. But kind of in the general, in the general case, like these, th this assembly code and the Python code on the last page are just nowhere near each other. The Python code is like, I add two objects, and they tell me how they want to be added. And this assembly code is like, I have two machine words in register, and in, 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 in two registers, and like, add the two of those. Like, they, they're just, there's just no way to reconcile the two things. And it gets even worse if you have something like this, right? Like, th this function, like, doesn't even, it, the, the types of this object are, like, on some server somewhere, right? Like, whatever, whatever like, if, if that JSON object has, like, two ints in it, then this is integer addition. If that JSON object has, like, two strings in it, this is string addition. Like, you, you can't hope for a compiler to be able to tell, uh, you know, what to do with the types of those two things. So we're in a bit of trouble here. Um, uh, and I, I don't mean to kind of set up things as like uh, types are the only thing that we're going to run into trouble with, but certainly it's a big hurdle to get across is like w this function, I, I don't know how to type the objects that we're going to be working with, let alone know how to convert that into some sort of machine code that I'm going to be able to compile uh, into. So <clears throat> uh, if we get back to sort of like the crux of the problem here or what might be the problem, my program's too slow, and you're telling me we can't write a compiler, so, so what's next? Um, <clears throat> so uh, the punchline is PyPy, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but certainly before PyPy exists, and even to some extent in some circles now, uh, the old answer was like, okay, so you need to change it in some way. Um, so your program's slow, you wrote it in Python, change it somehow. And there were sort of like three, at least three paths. These are kind of the most obvious ones. One of them was like, take a piece of it, uh, rewrite it in some other language, like C usually, and then use, let's say, the C Python C API, which is a way that you can take uh, a bunch of random C code and kind of like uh, use it from within Python. Um, so go take your Python code that was slow before, write it in C. Uh, then, of course, you are kind of like statically typed, so you do need to say what all the types of your stuff uh, is. Uh, and then, you know, you run it through your normal C compiler, out pops. Uh, a C extension module, uh, you load that from Python, and uh, basically you just rewrote a section of your code in Python uh, that was in Python into, into C. Um, so your code still behaves the same, but you changed it to basically be written in some other language and then plug that piece back in. Um, and there was an okay solution. Um, the C Python has, API has a lot of problems. Uh, and again, from people smarter than me, uh, it has a lot of problems that are quite hard or impossible to fix. Uh, in, in terms of like a compatibility, fr from a compatibility standpoint, like the, the C Python API exists and people use it, um, and a lot of things in there are kind of questionable, I think. Uh, but it's certainly an option. Uh, it certainly works. Uh, Cython was another option. Cython, uh, for those of you who haven't used it, it's basically uh, if C and Python had a kind of bastard child, that would probably end up looking like Cython. Uh, again, in that kind of like Cython's a good thing, uh, at least in the general sense. Like that, but that really is what it is. It's, it's basically like, it looks like Python uh, with a bunch of C sprinkled through. Um, and there are some additional mechanics that like, give you tighter interop. But basically, it's a thing that kind of looks like Python with a bunch of like, types mixed in uh, and some other functionality to like, import stuff from C if you actually feel like doing that, uh, and a couple other things. Um, and then that thing ends up getting compiled into, again, uh, an extension module that you can load. Um, so this is sort of like using the C Python API. It's a bit more portable in some sense. Uh, and it looks a lot more like the Python that you started with. So in some ways, this is changing your code less. Uh, 
And certainly, a lot of people do still use Cython. And from what I hear, some people actually tell me that they have quite a lot of reason to keep using Cython. Um, so that was certainly another reasonable uh, avenue to pursue. If, you're, if your program's too slow, you take a chunk of it, and again, you change it, you write it in Cython, and you plug it back in again. Uh, and then, of course, kind of like the most drastic uh, uh, or easy solution, depending on your perspective, is like just wholesale rip out a portion of your program, rewrite it in some other language, and communicate back and forth with some like inter-process communication. So like your program's too slow, great. Like, Take the section of it that's doing um, computationally intensive stuff, move it into some language that's more suitable for comp computationally intensive stuff, and then communicate back and forth over whatever method you'd like. Um, so these are the three historical choices. Um, uh, again, the, the punchline here is PyPy. Uh, but kind of the, the thing that's getting us to the punchline is a JIT. Um, so a JIT, just-in-time compiler, uh, is going to be our, our way, PyPy's way, of basically um, fixing some of the uh, kind of troublesome uh, problems that we were running in, into before about, like, how do I compile uh, programs that I don't know enough about? Um, just-in-time compilers, uh, the just-in-time being basically at runtime. So while your program is running, it's also potentially doing compilation. Um, that's kind of like uh, the, the, the piece of the puzzle that's like, OK, you, know, you don't have enough information ahead of time to know what you might need to generate, but maybe at runtime that'll be better. Uh, maybe while your program's executing, it'll be easier to figure out what I need to know. Um, and maybe even at runtime when I have more information, I can do even more intelligent things that I could have ahead of time. Um, so we're kind of partitioning the world of compile compilers now uh, so that you know, we, had our, we had our languages that we were discussing before, which are kind of like you take a compiler, you plug in the source code, out pops machine code, because that's what you need to execute, um, into this world now where like, OK, like we can't do that ahead of time. Um, we're going to do that at runtime. Uh, we still want to end up with some machine code, because that's what's going to end up being fast. Uh, we're going to get rid of that middle layer. Um, but we're going to do it at runtime when we have enough information. Uh, and so that's what PyPy is, basically. Uh, it's many things. Uh, sort of the most pertinent one for this discussion is that. Um, <clears throat> so it, in kind of like uh, correspondence with what we were talking about before, uh, it's written in a language called RPython. Uh, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, again, it's a program, so it has to be written in something, right? So it's a program that takes in a bunch of input, again, being Python source code, and out pops whatever output your source code actually performs. Um, so it's written in RPython. Same, very similar implementation to, uh, to C Python at kind of the high level. It again has a bytecode compiler, which means it takes your source code, turns it into some bytecode, and executes that bytecode on a VM. The difference is going to be that every once in a while it decides not to do that and to do something entirely different instead, which will be like produce some machine code and execute that instead of executing whatever bytecode corresponds to your source code. Um, <clears throat> and most importantly, it interprets the same exact language. So we're going to kind of. Uh, get exactly where we want to go here. Um, before I kind of uh, specifically say, so RPython, just another word on what RPython is. Uh, the R stands for restricted. Uh, it's a language. Uh, it's statically typed, and it's amenable to being uh, like annotated with types uh, as part of like the translation process. Uh, and it's also part of this like larger tool chain that can be used to write other interpreters other than PyPy. Um, uh, but it's basically Python. It's Python with static types. Uh, or slightly more kiddingly, what the uh, PyPy guys basically say is like, uh, it's this thing that accepts whatever subset of Python the translation toolchain doesn't error out on. Um, so it, it's, it's roughly Python uh, with a, uh, enough information to be able to statically, or to be able to precompile just the interpreter part. Um, <clears throat> so Can you say that last again? yes. Uh, so the last sentence was, our Python that PyPy is written in is basically a subset small enough of Python that it can be translated into machine code. So it has none of the problems that we mentioned before. Like you, you know, or it, the tool chain knows enough about what the types of everything is to produce machine code ahead of time. Um, and roughly, that's the important part. Uh, so uh, you run your Python code with CPython, assuming that's CPython. You run the same code with PyPy. Uh, and sort of the most important uh, part on this avenue is like, OK, we di finally, we didn't have to actually change anything in my code. Like, I wanted stuff to be fast, but I didn't want to learn some other language. 
Uh, and PyPy is kind of promising to be exactly that. Like, you, you take some code that you had before, you run it through PyPy, it's faster, you didn't need to do any extra work. So, <clears throat> uh, JITs were kind of like the vehicle uh, for how we got enough information. Um, the philosophy uh, is uh, something like this. Um, <clears throat> so, a lot of the trouble that you run into in Python uh, boils down to stuff like this, where you can do a lot of stuff, but some of the stuff that you can do is kind of unlikely uh, in like a probabilistic sense. Um, or maybe that, not, that, not quite that scientific, but like in Python you can do like a lot of crazy dynamic stuff, but you're very unlikely to actually be doing that crazy dynamic stuff. Um, and so if you can kind of like make some assumptions that nothing crazy is going on, you can kind of like get rid of a lot of the overhead that you would have otherwise had to have, deal, have dealt with um, from just kind of like a what the language allows you to do perspective. So, uh, so we, we spoke about one example before uh, about like just passing in whatever objects you feel like. Uh, if you had a program where kind of like, uh, imagine as like an external observer, which is really what the JIT is, you're kind of watching this function being called and you see it like 20,000 times being called with two integers. Um, now, it's, it's very possible for your program all of a sudden to start calling it with a bunch of strings instead, but from a probabilistic point of view, if you see it like 20,000 times, you're gonna say, you know what, probably this is going to be called with integers. If it turns out something else happens, you'll need to deal with that situation because of course you can't sacrifice the program doing the right thing to make it fast. But at least from kind of like a optimization standpoint or like a what can I assume about this program, uh, it's probably reasonable to assume that what you're seeing so far is what you're gonna continue to see until you see otherwise. Um, same thing here for just like literally attribute access. So attribute access is very expensive in Python, uh, C Python. Uh, why is that? Because like if you want to attribute, if you want to access some attribute off of an object, uh, you've probably seen like most objects have uh, dictionaries that actually map their attribute names to the values, uh, and you can't get rid of that dictionary really. Uh, besides slots, uh, you you can't really get rid of that uh, dictionary because someone can come along to your object and just add random attributes to it, right? Like your object didn't have an attribute called like blah or whatever. Someone can come along at some point in the program, just plant another attribute on your object. Uh, and the object needs to keep track of that additional attribute um, so that like every, everything needs to know like where is that attribute living in memory. Um, you know, you, you can't just kind of like allocate a bunch of memory and say like here, this is all I need for this object and I can just kind of look up attributes by just indexing into that memory. You need to actually maintain a whole bunch of other information because you know, if someone comes along and adds a bunch of new attributes, um, you're gonna need to be able to put them somewhere. Um, so even something as uh, like completely simple as accessing an attribute, uh, in CPython, like, other than slots, you, you need to actually do uh, a hash lookup uh, to actually figure out, you know, what the value of that attribute is, uh, and that's expensive. Um, whereas if, if we can make the assumption that we made before, uh, and we say, like, you know what, some things actually the language allows you to do, but they're not likely to happen. So an object like changing types, uh, like there was an, like uh, there, there was a, or our function example, there's a function that every time we see it, it has the same types going through it, yeah, I mean, it's possible for all of a sudden new types to start coming through, but it's, let's say, unlikely. Or changing attributes, right? So classes have some, no, uh, or instances have some number of attributes. It's possible for all of a sudden um, that instance to have like a whole bunch of different attributes than the ones that it had before, but it's not very likely. Generally speaking, objects keep their attributes um, over their lifetime, not necessarily the attribute values, but at least like the set of attribute names at least that's constant enough over the lifetime that maybe we can make an assumption about that. And if it's not true, um, there'll be mechanisms in PyPy, which I won't discuss, to kind of like, guards, to, to, uh, to kind of like uh, make sure that we don't do anything terribly wrong, but, uh, but we can kind of make this assumption, try and make things fast, and if they turn out not to be true, then we'll have to go back to the slow route. <clears throat> uh, and sort of the other key piece here is like, most programs, uh, spend a lot of their time in a relatively small number of places. So if you have like one loop where you're doing the majority of your computation or a bunch of loops where you're doing the majority of your computation, relatively speaking, they're probably not like, you know, if you, your program probably doesn't spend most of its time in a full 50% of its uh, source code. It's probably somewhere uh, in a bunch of kind of localized places. Um, and so what this means combined with what we said before is basically if we can just kind of hit those places uh, and compile them at runtime uh, through the JIT, we're gonna basically speed up your entire program uh, 
uh, because that's where your program is spending most of its time. Um, so all that was kind of section one. Uh, that was hopefully enough background information just to see um, what the general strategy is. Uh, I'm going to transition to talking about uh, stuff that we've learned along the way at uh, Magnetic, we've been running PyPy in production at very large scale for probably about three years now. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a bunch of stuff uh, which shouldn't be terribly surprising, but just some of the stuff that we've kind of had to deal with along the way, and it's um, s some of which I hope is fairly expected. Uh, but any questions on sort of the first half of things? Okay. Uh, there'll be more time at the end, I hope. <clears throat> uh, so just in a general sense, um, it's probably most pertinent to talk about like our largest app, uh, which we run on, you know, let's say 100 servers, um, uh, does like 400k or 500k QPS, uh, and just from like literally taking the word Python and replacing it with PyPy, uh, just like magic 30% uh, speed up uh, without doing any work. Uh, and of course, I mentioned before that PyPy is only going to help you if you're CPU bound or if you're doing a lot of computation. This app isn't CPU bound, which is why that number isn't way larger. Um, so this is like a web app you can think of. So it has like a portion of what it's doing that's kind of like CPU intensive, and that part of the request will end up getting sped up. Um, but overall, it's like uh, it, it's a web app. Um, not a client-facing web app, but it's a web app. Uh, and so 30% from an app that's basically spending, you know, a quarter of its request doing CPU bound stuff is just like literally money in the bank. Um, uh, okay, so sort of the first thing you'll probably encounter, assuming you're convinced so far. Uh, so if you do switch to PyPy, the first thing you'll probably encounter um, is like, okay, so are all of the libraries that I want to use actually compatible? Um, <clears throat> so there's actually a decent story for that now uh, in the sense that like there's a website, it's packages.pypy.org. The URL isn't on there, I apologize. Um, but it shouldn't be hard to Google if you don't remember packages.pypy.org. Um, so what it is is basically a list of the top thousand packages on uh, PyPI, very confusingly not PyPy. So on PyPI, uh, listing of the top thousand packages, uh, and then whether or not they're compatible with PyPy. Actually, don't recommend you check it out because I can give you the summary right now. Ninety-nine, or probably about ninety-five percent are, and the ones that aren't uh, are things in the kind of NumPy ecosystem other than NumPy itself, which is undergoing porting. Um, so like a large majority of the stuff that's on that list is going to be uh, of the 5% or however many percent is going to be stuff in that ecosystem, which we'll come back to in the end. Um, otherwise, the large majority of things on that list are just green. So I would say at this point in uh, PyPy's life cycle, just assume uh, that things are going to be compatible other than a specific list. And basically, um, again, the scientific stuff is certainly one section uh, and certainly needs addressing. Um, and the other stuff is going to be uh, libraries that use C extensions uh, are going to be either iffy or slow um, because the C API is CPython's C API. And so PyPy kind of emulates whatever parts of that it can. Um, but even the parts uh, that can't, uh, sorry, th there are parts of it that it can't. Um, so popular you know, examples of libraries there. If you're using MySQL Python, which I would, remember, I would recommend, well, first of all, they try not to use MySQL. But even if you are, don't use MySQL Python if you can. It's quite old, and uh, even if you're using MySQL, there are kind of newer libraries out there. But if you are, uh, it does have a C extension. Uh, I don't think it will install on PyPy at all. Um, other libraries, I think the, the Postgres library for Python Psycho PG2, I think, also tries to compile a C extension. Um, so there are a couple of examples like that. Uh, but generally speaking, for those kind of libraries that have C extensions, either it will not use the C extension on PyPy, um, or there are kind of like equivalent libraries. So like the Postgres one, there's a Psycho PG2 CFFI library, which is basically a drop-in replacement. Um, but certainly, like, are all of the libraries I'm using compatible with PyPy is the first thing you'll probably have to check if you're porting over an existing thing. Um, and again, the answer is basically, if they're pure Python, yes, absolutely. If they're not, Either look for pure Python replacements, or it might work anyways because of the C Python C API. Um, but it's kind of, excuse me, it's kind of a jarring uh, transition to make when you're first using PyPy because what you start to look for is the exact opposite of what you looked for before. Um, because now every time you see a README, you probably want to check and look that it says pure Python, which means faster on PyPy, uh, rather than what you were looking for before, which 
certainly tends to happen in readmes where they call out, hey, I have a really fast C extension uh, that I use to actually do computation that's going to make your program slower, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> Uh, other things that you'll probably encounter, so this didn't happen to our own code, but you'll find uh, lots of programs with bugs in it, unfortunately, um, and bugs in a specific sense here. So unfortunately, this code has, has a bug, uh, and a, a bug other than the fact that I didn't define process here, like this code leaks a file descriptor. So it, it opens a file, uh, reads it, and then never kind of like closes the file. Um, you won't notice this bug on CPython because CPython has a reference counting implementation. Um, but on, on, uh, on implementations of, Py of Python, including PyPy, but not only PyPy, um, that don't use reference counting, this will leak a file descriptor, which will maybe eventually get closed. But if you're doing this in a big loop uh, and you try opening a whole bunch of these, like your program's going to crash. Uh, or, sorry, your program's going to run out of file descriptors. Um, thankfully, our own code uh, didn't have, I think, any of these issues. Um, but you, you will run into uh, if you try running, uh, we run DevPy under PyPy, and it had one of these issues recently. Um, so like other, other people's code that you run into might potentially have these sorts of issues, and you kind of will have to know to look for them. Um, if you see your program run out of file descriptors, uh, your first guess when you're using PyPy is like, okay, someone forgot to close a bunch of files um, and is relying on kind of like CPython's specific uh, behavior there, which, again, the same thing will happen if you run this code under like Iron Python or like Jython or any of the other implementations of Python that don't use reference counting. Um, <clears throat> kind of the next uh, thing that you'll probably run into, maybe the first thing for those of you who are like ops people in the room, uh, is handling provisioning. Excuse me. The next slide. <clears throat> so if you, go on the, if you go on the PyPy website, they do have downloads. You can like download PyPy binaries. Unfortunately, if you're running uh, like Linux, the world is kind of sad uh, when it comes to binaries uh, in the sense that like the, the binaries that are available are kind of like dynamically linked to some system libraries. Um, so when you download a library from pypy.org, uh, if you're on Linux, you need to be on the distribution that it was actually compiled for, otherwise it's unlikely to work. Um, they do have some like semi-portable uh, versions, uh, but what we do is basically we use um, <clears throat> So that portable PyPy thing there, uh, which uh, if you're on Linux and you want to deploy PyPy, I would say just go straight here. Uh, even if you are on one of those other distributions, uh, it's just easy. We, we basically just plop portable PyPy everywhere. Uh, and what it is is basically like it's a tarball with PyPy inside. Um, and the PyPy in the tarball is kind of uh, scrubbed in a way that it actually will run kind of portably. Um, so we run CentOS uh, and uh, kind of the, the PyPy release cycle is fairly fast, and generally speaking, you do want to kind of stay um, as, as current as you can because they do make kind of very significant uh, improvements as time goes on. Uh, and so, like, he basically puts out um, portable PyPy tarballs like a day after the release is done. Um, so we kind of just have some provisioning scripts that basically will go off, grab the n newer version, uh, and just, like, kind of up upgrade the whole infrastructure to whatever next version um, kind of completely portably. Uh, at least for our sake. Uh, there are some issues. Uh, this one I pulled kind of selfishly. Um, so certainly, like, again, the world of Linux is rough when it comes to binaries. Um, so like, you, you, you might notice uh, things like this, which is like uh, it statically links against OpenSSL. And like, because it does that, like, there are uh, kind of hard-coded paths that it's expecting. I think this is an OpenSSL problem more than a portable PyPy problem. but like. Uh, it won't be able to find your system uh, certificate bundle, um, which basically leads to things like this, where like uh, we don't actually do any uh, SSL from within our server apps, but if we did, uh, we probably would have noticed this sooner, which is like it can't find any certificates, which means uh, you can't verify any uh, certificates that you might be receiving. Uh, and so you, you have to know to kind of like set an environment variable so that uh, when you run that portable PyPy distribution, uh, it knows where to find the uh, certificates on your system. Um, <clears throat> so there are certainly uh, issues. I would probably, um, not to apologize for them, but I would probably call these more like Linux issues or uh, OpenSSL issues more than PyPy issues. But certainly, you do need to be aware of things like this, that, um, that it, it is kind of a story to download uh, up-to-date 
binaries on Linux unless you're going to build them yourself, which you can do, uh, which I'd re recommend you do at least once. Uh, but it's kind of annoying to, uh, to automate a little bit um, because building PyPy takes about an hour or an hour and a half. Uh, OK, so provisioning. Uh, there's also a story for deployment. So in the normal world, uh, you're potentially used to doing deployment kind of like this. Um, certainly, this is how we used to do it. Um, so when you do a deployment, you push out the new version of your code and then restart the service. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, if you do this with PyPy, your entire infrastructure is just going to like get distracted doing jitting instead of actually doing any of the work that your service usually does. Um, because if you if you run, let's say, you know, a web app with a whole bunch of processes and then you restart them, um, something that we uh, didn't really talk about before is basically the JIT kind of needs to run and do the compilation uh, when it notices that your program is, you know, hot in a certain area and it tries to compile a particular area of your program. So if you kind of like deployed your whole infrastructure and then just restart all your services for the first, you know, X number of seconds, your entire infrastructure is going to basically be compiling stuff instead of serving any requests. So that's not that great. Uh, so instead what you have to do is kind of like a more like uh, rolling uh, sort of thing. Uh, so what we do is fairly simple. Uh, literally right now what we do is um, we, we basically go off to all of our services, uh, all of them kind of pre-fork. Um, so we actually use GUnicorn to serve web apps, let's say. Um, so we have GUnicorn pre-forking, uh, you know, 24 child processes. And then instead of doing a restart, uh, which would cause the whole machine to start, you know, compiling instead of doing anything useful, we basically kill off each of the processes one by one with a delay in between. Um, so that kind of like uh, lets the machine keep serving some requests uh, while still actually, you know, restarting the process. Um, it's not foolproof, certainly, and it complicates deployments a little bit because uh, if you do change uh, something that needed to actually change in the master process too, you need to know that you need to do a full restart. Otherwise, when you fork, you won't actually get whatever change that you um, that you wanted to. So for example, if you actually change the underlying version of PyPy that you were using and then you fork from the master process that you didn't kill, you're going to get the wrong binary. Uh, you're going to be running the, the old version. Uh, this is kind of a funny problem uh, that actually happened to us. Unfortunately, uh, and this is now complete marketing, so I apologize, PyPy was too fast uh, in the sense that when we switched uh, our last remaining app over to it, uh, it actually blew out uh, uh, or kind of saturated our firewall. Um, so we literally had to roll it back. Uh, I think it's probably still rolled back, right? Yeah, so it's waiting for firewall upgrades. Uh, so beware of your network. Um, it's a great problem to have. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to put GDBM on a slide just because how many people in this room know what GDBM is? Is it more than one? None. How come you guys aren't raising your hand? We use it. <laughs> Uh, so, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, GDBM is is basically the the SQLite of key value stores. Yeah, it's a DBM. Uh, so, so it, how many how many people now know that it's in the standard library? So, yeah. So there's a standard library module uh, implementing GDBM. We use it uh, for okay reasons. Um, PyPy didn't have the GDBM module when we actually switched to PyPy three years ago uh, for quite fantastic reasons, uh, basically because the CPython, C, CPython didn't have any tests for it, so they didn't know it existed. Uh, so like PyPy runs the CPython test suite, but CPython had no tests for it, so the PyPy guys didn't notice it existed. Uh, so they had to add it afterwards. Um, so so uh, I put this up here mostly uh, to tell that story, but also because th those sorts of things do come up every once in a while where Unfortunately, like every piece of software, CPython's test suite um, has a bunch of holes in, in a couple of places, most of them not often traveled, like GDBM. Uh, and so every once in a while, you'll run into something that like, doesn't work on PyPy, but maybe doesn't really work on CPython either, because there aren't any tests actually verifying that it does the right thing. Um, so every once in a while, this does come up where you'll kind of hit a dark corner of Python, um, and it won't work because there's no test verifying that it works upstream either. Uh, and then uh, I would be remiss to not talk a little bit about profiling, um, not very much about specifics. So like uh, if you're in the CPython world, I'm sure you're fairly used to running, let's say, the C profile module or like 
time it, uh, or sort of like these uh, standard library uh, little profiling tools. Maybe you're used to other ones too. Um, we have to be a little bit careful when you're using PyPy how you interpret their results. So certainly because of JIT warmup like we talked about before, uh, if you just run some sort of profiling without doing that, your results are pretty much meaningless um, because you're measuring uh, the portion of your program, uh, you're, you're timing things in your program before, uh, before they actually uh, have sort of reached their final characteristics. Um, but once they do reach those final characteristics, the sort of like information that you're getting out of C profile is still misleading because it's still telling you about kind of like Python code that's executing um, instead of giving you information about potentially jitted code that's executing. Um, and so the world of profiling is a little bit different for PyPy. Uh, there's this thing called VMProf, uh, which is somewhat immature but definitely usable. Uh, it will tell you things like what portions of your code have been jitted already. Uh, it'll tell you like your, your code has been 80% jitted. Uh, and it'll tell you to sort of like which functions have been jitted. Like um, there, there are sort of like internal PyPy to, tools for telling you um, you know, what, what the JIT is doing when it's compiling, um, uh, all those sorts of things. So there's kind of a uh, slightly uh, either expanded or modified tool set for doing profiling, uh, which you do need to be aware of. Um, and then before I get to this question, uh, which is obviously the most subjective one in the whole talk, um, there are, uh, just slipped my mind. So never mind, we'll just get right to this. Uh, so, so why doesn't everyone use this? If I remember, we'll come back to it. Um, so the first reason, uh, which probably covers 90% of, uh, uh, of the answer to this question is like performance doesn't matter. For most programs, performance doesn't matter. Um, specifically if you're IO bound, uh, like we said before, so PyPy is going to help you again kind of get rid of that step where you're executing lots of instructions instead of executing some smaller number. For most applications, performance doesn't matter. It's fast enough. Um, I like mentioning because uh, it because it makes it kind of like beefs us up as like Python people. Uh, there's a guy, Greg Wilson, uh, who likes to talk about uh, the study done by someone whose name, unfortunately, I've forgotten, uh, where basically a bunch of people were asked to uh, implement a particular algorithm uh, in Python, in C, in Java. Uh, and uh, if you haven't read that study, uh, the, the results basically said, uh, like the ultimate source code that was produced at least between, let's say, Python and C, differed by like 1.3 times. Um, so whereas the language has, languages have very different uh, performance characteristics, uh, when you ask humans to write programs in them, they tend to usually write programs that are roughly the same speed, uh, even without all the stuff that we've talked about. Um, so it's kind of an interesting side study, uh, which I will try linking to the slides. Um, so even if performance doesn't matter, uh, occasionally performance doesn't matter yet, uh, because you have those other solutions that we talked about before. Uh, and then once we get past those two, we get into kind of more uh, interesting uh, answers for the remaining 10%. Um, so if you're deeply invested in CPython, again, the scientific uh, areas of the ecosystem uh, do tend to have uh, issues moving over. Um, most of those are related to how deeply those, uh, that ecosystem is already invested in external languages. Um, so we mentioned, you know, PyPy is going to make your Python code fast, and it's trying to discourage you from uh, taking sections and writing it in some other language. Unfortunately, because the, that ecosystem already wanted fast code, large portions of that ecosystem are written in other languages, Fortran, C, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then this one. Uh, so there, there is PyPy for Python 3. Uh, I've never heard of anyone running it in production, but I don't run generally in circles where I hear about people running Python 3 in production regardless. So if you are running Python 3 in production, maybe try it out. Uh, otherwise, for us, the let's make code faster was an easy choice. Um, but certainly, this does come up uh, as a reason why people don't run it. Uh, so this is my personal guess as to why more people don't use it is marketing. That's why I'm here. Uh, I don't work with them. But like, you should run it. Our internal policy, which you guys should know, is basically like all new applications target PyPy directly. There's no reason. Um, why not to use it for everything, um, at least for us. Uh, and that's it. Questions? Anything? <laughs> <laughs>